We are working out some technical issues, so if you can just work with us for a, a couple minutes, we're going to begin shortly. Test one, two, test one, two, test one, two, three, four. So test for master control. Test one, two, test, test. One, one, two, three, four. Test one, two. Test one, two, three, four. Test one, two, three, four. Good morning. Thank you. That's a little better. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Councilmember Jamani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Councilmembers Grodenchik and Chin. We are here to hold an oversight hearing, probably the uh, 
last oversight hearing of this term for this committee on home ownership in New York City. Less than one third of New York City households own a home compared with more than two thirds of households nationwide. With an extremely expensive real estate market, New York homeowners are almost exclusively high income. Studies have found that households must make 165% of the area median family income to be able to afford a home. HPD has a number of active programs designed to facilitate access to home ownership in New York City. The statewide Mitchell Lama program provides low interest mortgage loans and property tax exemptions to developers in exchange for limited own ownership profits and placing income limitations on households, allowing Mitchell Lama properties to operate below market rate rents. HPD works with New York State and the Housing Partnership Development Corporation to subsidize the New Homes Program, which has created 60,000 affordable housing units over the past 35 years. HPD also operates the New Info Homeownership Opportunities Program, NEHOP, which subsidizes developments aimed at households earning up to 130% of AMI, and the Home First Down Payment Assistance Program, which provides $25,000 to first-time home buyers with a household income below 80% AMI. <clears throat> Additionally, the City's Housing New York 2.0 program, which was released on November 15, 2017, includes Open Door, which finances construction of co-ops and condos for households earning between 80% and 130% of AMI, and the Home Fix program, which funds home repairs for low and moderate income homeowners. Finally, HPD funds community land trusts, COTs, which are not-for-profit organizations that own land and promote affordable housing development and the neighborhood revitalization. I'm hearing the hearing today will explore these programs and their effects on home ownership in New York City. I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Megan Chen, and counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst to the committee, Sarah Gasolum, and the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the Sergeant of Arms. Before we go to the administration, uh, my colleague, Councilmember Margaret Chin has asked and requested that she can give a statement before her because of her interest in home ownership and because of her prevalence of HDFCs in her district. Since this is the last committee and there is a few council members here, I'm glad to grant that request. Thank you, Chair Williams. I'm visiting because it's a very important topic. And good morning. Thank you, Chair William, for hearing this very important topic. Affordable home ownership needs to be part of the affordable housing conversation. Home ownership is one of the most powerful and sustainable vehicles for addressing income inequality for communities of color and immigrant communities. Unfortunately, home ownership is completely out of reach for many New Yorkers. At this moment in New York City, affordable housing production has not kept pace with the rising rents while income have generally remained stagnant. However, there are some common sense measure that our city can take right now to make the American dream of owning a home a reality for New Yorkers. First, we need to embrace the idea of community land trusts. With adequate engagement to small property owners and by working with trusted nonprofits, CLTs can provide our communities with more opportunities for current renters to become affordable homeowners. Second, we need to protect the home ownership program that are currently in place. While I understand the need to ensure that HDFCs are sustainable for the future, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all solution, nor allow mass foreclosure on one of the most important affordable housing stocks we have in the city. HDFC shareholders, many who are in this chamber today, have invested significant amount of their own money, sweat equity, and effort into their homes and their community. Instead of permanently taking away these affordable housing units, the city should re-examine the necessary tools available and invest the appropriate resources so that all HDFCs can thrive. Finally, the city and state needs to reinvest in the Mitchell Lama program, which has given thousands of families the opportunity to invest and help build up their neighborhoods. These simple measures, along with more education and outreach about home ownership, is one of the best ways to begin narrowing the income inequality gap, provide families with a pathway to the middle class, and ensure our communities have something to pass on to future generations. 
Once again, I want to thank Chair Williams for the opportunity for me to say a few words, and I look forward to hearing from the administration and the public about this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Chin, um, for those words. Um, before we go to administration, and a complete side note, since we had this technical stuff um, fixed and we are online, if anybody's watching from Alabama, hope you're doing the right thing right now. <laughs> With that, we have uh, Deputy Commissioner Molly Park, also Deputy Commissioner Anne Marie. Are you, are you testifying? Okay. Um, if you can, whoever's testifying, just raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And you can begin. Great. Good morning, Chairman Williams and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Molly Park, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Development with the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Thank you for the invitation to testify on HPD's homeownership initiatives and the role that these programs play in New York City's housing market. Affordable housing is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face, and correspondingly, it is one of the top priorities of Mayor de Blasio's administration. Housing New York, as well as our updated commitment to build even more affordable housing outlined in Housing New York 2.0, is a critical pillar of a broader administration-wide agenda to keep the city affordable, competitive, and sustainable. HPD is continually modernizing our programs and creating new tools to better address the many facets of the affordable housing crisis, including the challenge of affordable home ownership to build more equitable and stable communities. It is no secret that New York City's real estate market is booming. New York City housing prices increased dramatically from 1990 to 2015 and have expanded to almost all of the city's neighborhoods. However, wages have not increased at the same rate. During this time, there was a 200% increase in property values relative to an 11% decrease in real median household income. And while the population increased more in the first six years of this decade than in the entire previous decade, we added only half the number of new homes during that six-year period than we did during the prior decade. Rental housing is the main focus of our Housing New York plan for a few reasons. First, it has low barriers to entry and can serve a wide range of New Yorkers, including those with very low and extremely low incomes. Second, an affordable rental unit remains affordable to households at specific incomes for the duration of its regulatory period, even as tenants may turn over many times. Third, rental housing can more easily be produced at a large scale, giving financing constraints in the New York City market. Yet the benefits of homeownership are undeniable. First, homeownership has historically served to stabilize distressed neighborhoods. Homeowners have a financial stake in their neighborhoods, so they often remain even if poor neighborhood conditions persist. Homeowners have a personal stake in the investments that they make in their community. Today, many New York City neighborhoods are grappling with rising prices rather than disinvestment, but there are still several neighborhoods where homeownership can serve as an important stabilizing force. Second, homeownership also serves as a wealth building tool for homeowners. Affordable homeownership programs can provide greater access to this wealth building opportunity for disadvantaged groups who would otherwise be unable to become homeowners. Affordable homeownership programs help working class New Yorkers access the homeownership market, a sector of the housing world that is all but off limits to lower income New Yorkers. We have seen that homeownership is largely inaccessible to middle and moderate income New Yorkers. For example, in 2014, only 42% of sales were affordable to households earning less than $114,000, or about, uh, that's 120% of area median income. That means that less than half of 2014 sales were affordable to 77% of New York City households. Therefore, affordable home ownership is a critical piece of housing New York as we work to balance the equation on behalf of hardworking New York City families. Creating opportunities for more New Yorkers to own a piece of their city and helping existing homeowners to stay in their homes and keep those homes in good condition is an essential part of that plan. Homeownership helps families build wealth and can help to stabilize neighborhoods in transition. However, there is no one-size-fits-all approach that meets all of these needs, which is why we are always looking for new tools, new partners, and new innovations to get the work done faster and better. I will now outline the ways in which we have been successful so far in achieving increased homeownership as well as our plans for future innovations. 
The administ administration unveiled a comprehensive plan in May 2014 to create and preserve 200,000 high quality affordable residences over 10 years. As an agency, we have spoken before this body many times about the successes we have achieved to make record-breaking progress towards our goals. It is because of this commitment that we've been able to build affordable housing at rates New York has not seen in 30 years. This is why we recently announced Housing New York 2.0, through which we are accelerating and expanding our preservation and construction of affordable apartments to reach 300,000 homes by 2026. Homeownership programs have received less attention than other aspects of Housing New York, but since the inception of the housing plan, HPD has recognized that homeownership is a key tool in the fight to combat the rising costs of the real estate market. I'm proud to say that since the beginning of Housing New York in January, on January 1, 2014, we have financed over 11,000 affordable homeownership opportunities across the five boroughs. Over 55% of these homeownership opportunities to date have been for very low or low-income households. However, the city's white-hot real estate market has discouraged many families from believing that they ever could own their own home. Creating new programs and modernizing existing ones will help families struggling to buy their own piece of New York or to remain homeowners. Through Ho Housing New York 2.0, HPD is investing in two critical production programs to expand the reach of our homeownership initiatives. First, HPD is committing to create the Home Fix program which will help low and moderate income homeowners in one to four family properties to fund home repairs. There is high demand for these relatively small scale loans to help families stay in their homes, but HPD's existing programs to meet this need have not kept up with the realities of the marketplace. HPD will update program operations and infuse new funds into the initiative, thereby allowing us to serve many more households each year. Financial assistance will be paired with financial counseling to address the full spectrum of needs of families struggling to make mortgage payments while also paying for home repairs. In the same update to the plan, HPD recognizes that homeownership is a critical tool for families to move up the economic ladder by building assets. We are therefore introducing Open Door, a new program to finance the construction of co-ops and condos for households earning between approximately $69,000 to $112,000. That's 80% to 130% of area median income. Uh, through the program, owners will build limited equity in their homes over time, balancing the goal of asset building with the city's need for ongoing affordability for future generations. We are in the process of crafting a term sheet for this program, which we expect to release in early 2018. We welcome feedback from stakeholders on these term sheets and are happy to set up meetings with any interested council members. But beyond production, many families are still struggling in the wake of the mortgage crisis and are in need of a lifeline. Since the start of Housing New York, the administration has repeatedly created groundbreaking tools to address the spectrum of needs. Last year, HPD intervened through the Community Restoration Fund Program to purchase 24 distressed Federal Housing Administration notes for one to four family homes, with a total of 41 residential units in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and St on Staten Island, facilitating the acquisition of distressed community assets from mortgage lenders and repositioning them to preserve affordable homeownership and rental opportunities has allowed HPD to stabilize neighborhoods with high rates of foreclosure and distress ensure positive outcomes for homeowners and residents, and maintain affordability and viability of the citywide housing stock. With a grant from the New York State, from New York State Attorney General Eric T. Schneiderman, administered by the Local Initiative Support Corporation, we started our first Zombie Homes Initiative to increase direct outreach to families in foreclosure and develop targeted plans to secure abandoned homes. Zombie properties are vacant homes in which owners have been in default on their mortgage payments for more than 90 days. Many of these homes are not being properly maintained, creating blight and potential safety concerns that hurt our neighborhoods. This initiative is now staffed up and we have started our initial inventory and outreach to come up with a tailored strategy for each vacant and abandoned property to try and stabilize these communities. Additionally, HPD will also pursue reforms to the 2016 New York State Zombie Property and Foreclosure Prevention Act to strengthen the enforcement of bank requirements to maintain zombie properties. With Council Member Rafael Espinal and the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, we launched a new homeowner help desk in East New York. One of the commitments we made to the community, this program connects homeowners with services, counseling, and resources they need to stay in their homes and neighborhood. 
The desk assists homeowners with a range of services, including advice and assistance with foreclosure prevention, guidance on scam avoidance, advice on home repair and other programs like weatherization loans, and assistance with addressing scams. Last January, in an effort to use all of the available tools to confront the need for affordable housing, HPD requests a request for expressions of interest, or RFEI, to better understand how community land trusts can improve upon or fill gaps in the city's already extensive affordable housing arsenal. Although I will not go into the issue of CLTs in depth due to the recent hearing on local legislation related to CLTs, a CLT is a not-for-profit organization formed to own land and to maintain control and oversight of houses or rental buildings located on the land. $1.65 million was awarded to 12 community CLTs to create and expand this model of affordable housing in New York City through Enterprise's new Community Land Trust Capacity Building Initiative. One of the challenges in affordable homeownership is managing resales in a way that allows owners to get some return on their equity while also ensuring long-term affordability. The community-driven mission of CLTs positions them well to strike that balance. The homeownership production programs in Housing New York 2.0 and the new initiatives I just described build upon a long history of investment in homeownership. I want to briefly mention some of our existing programs. We are providing down payment assistance to first-time low-income homeowners from the South Shore of Staten Island to Borough Park, Brooklyn, and Flushing, Queens. We are collaborating with NYCHA to rehab and create affordable homeownership in homes that have been foreclosed on by HUD and managed by NYCHA through the NYCHA Small Homes Program. We are extending affordability and rehabilitating large Michelama co-ops like Strikers Bay and Clayton Apartments. We are seeing more interest by co-ops in our Green Housing Preservation Program, which provides low or no interest loans for small and mid-sized buildings owners to improve the energy efficiency and water conservation of their properties. We are advancing the pipeline on our Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, designed to accelerate the process of converting buildings in our Tenant Interim Lease Program into affordable co-ops. And last but certainly not least, we are preserving permanent affordability for the community by establishing parameters for the sale, resale, and inheritance of, inheritance of restricted housing in inclusionary housing. Such important work has not been done alone. We recognize the countless community-based organizations, nonprofits, and interested stakeholders who provide supportive partnerships. We also thank the City Council for their support of homeownership as a tool to stabilize neighborhoods while building assets and equity. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss our achievements around affordable and moderate income homeownership, as well as our robust plan for the future related to further increase in homeownership opportunities and stabilize communities across the five boroughs. I especially want to thank Councilmember Williams on behalf of all of HPD for a constructive relationship over the last four years of the, as the chair of this committee. I look forward to answering any questions you may have at this time. Thank you so much for the testimony and, and the kind word at the end. Uh, I too think it was a pretty constructive four years and I'm very proud of what we did in this committee. I um, got some big dreams for next year and so does uh, my colleague to, to my left. But um, <laughs> I can, um, I don't know, I'll be uh, either have achieved those dreams or I'll be in a cubicle somewhere. But uh, either, either way, uh, it's possible. <laughs> uh, either way, I think we did really have some constructive uh, years, and I really appreciate it, even through disagreement. Hopefully, people will look back on what we did through disagreement and really push forward uh, some really meaningful things. So thank you for that partnership as well. Um, and I just want to give credit. This was a, a hearing that HPD actually pushed uh, very hard to have, and I'm, I'm glad they did because it was important, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that for the record as well. We've been joined by Councilmember Espinal, Councilmember Carnegie. Um, I will have a couple questions and followed by my colleagues and then some questions after. Um, I just wanted to point out there was one stat that was very alarming in the beginning from 1990 to 2015. According to your statistics, there was a 200 percent increase in property values versus an 11 percent decrease in real median household incomes. Um, that is a pretty alarming stat um, that just says a lot. I, I also just really quick wanted to ask. When, how and when do you decide which AMIs to use? On, on the second page, you cited $114,000 as 120% of AMI for a family of four. And then on page three, you cited 80% to 130% AMI for a family of three. So I just want to know how we compare apples to apples and when we decide which AMIs to use. Sure. Um, 
Actually, we generally use family of three as our metric, and apologies, we should have, have caught that in our testimony. Um, we try and make sure that we have programs that serve a range of different AMIs. Um, for our new construction program, for the open door program that we are launching now, we are focused on moderate and middle income uh, first time home buyers. We, uh, home ownership comes with both a, a cost to entry, right, in the form of a down payment, and also people who are homeowners are vulnerable to various ups and downs in the marketplace. If there is a spike in fuel costs, if there's a need for a repair, if there are, for example, changes in the state and local tax environment, we need people to be able to, to weather those shocks. So moderate income households are um, somewhat better positioned than some, some of the lower income households to be able to manage the ups and downs of, of the re market that comes with home ownership. That being said, we know we have a number of lower income homeowners who are in place now and we certainly want to protect their rights as homeowners. So the uh, Home Fix program, for example, which is helping existing homeowners to repair their homes will serve homeowners at a lower, lower AMI levels. Thank you. Um, but for clarity, your baseline is usually for a family of three. Typically a family of three, but we adjust, right? So we, we use a family of three as our talking point because it is the most common New York City family size. But uh, if you are, in fact, a family of four or a family of two, we adjust the AMI, the incomes accordingly. Oh. So, so, so you were, if you were a family of five, for example, you a higher income is eligible for that same program. Oh, so you would use the, the let's say, 120% for family four if they came in, for family three if they came in, and family five if they came in? Right. Okay. Um, so um, I have seen Housing New York 2.0. Um, I am going to credit some of us uh, in this committee and this body uh, for pushing uh, uh, some of the new term sheets, some of the new goals that are uh, coming out. Uh, we've been pretty vociferous on that, I personally. I uh, think some of the term sheet stuff should have been an MIH. Hopefully we review that again uh, next term. We'll see. Um, but how is, uh, what progress has been made uh, since the new rollout of uh, 2.0 plan? Uh, sure. So the 2.0 was officially rolled out three weeks ago or something like that. So um, we are in the, actively launching a number of different programs, um, but I will say that we are still in the implement, early implementation phase. So um, to speak specifically about the homeownership programs, we, we have a term sheet for Open Door that is drafted. We are meeting with some of our uh, nonprofit and developer stakeholders and we'll be reaching out to the council to, to start getting input on the draft term sheet. I think uh, either later this month or early in January. We are also, we're doing interviews with a number of stakeholders in the home fix space, so groups that have worked directly with, with individual homeowners to really try and make sure that we have a good handle on what needs are, both with respect to repair, but also getting a handle on uh, arrears that people might be facing uh, to get input from various stakeholders about how best to connect with homeowners um, and make sure that we have a program that is sustainable. Um, other things that we have going on, a program that is not homeownership oriented specifically, but that I'm really excited about is our Neighborhood Pillars program, which is to help nonprofits and other mission-based developers to acquire existing rent-stabilized buildings. We are in the process of doing the outreach to create the funding tools that we need to do that, um, expanding the, down the New York City Acquisition Fund. So we have a lot of program design and launch work that is underway. Um, some of the programs will start to see some starts in, in pilot pro projects in the some in December and more in June, but we will be rolling out programs more aggressively going forward. Thank you. Um, and just for the record, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have your, obviously new targets for the new plan. I still submit that it doesn't go far enough. In particular, the goal, I believe, for low and very low income are around 25% where the population for that same target is around 
41, 42 percent. And so I think we're falling short. That's, we had a whole hearing about it, but I just want to make sure I put it on the record as many times as I can. Um, the home fix program, can you provide some additional details? In particular, uh, with the gentrification is happening, a, a lot of, not a lot, but, you know, well, a significant amount of people are seniors who oftentimes sell their homes because they can't upkeep. And so I just want to know more about the details of that program. Is it being targeted to those uh, homeowners and how so? Yeah, exactly. So we have three programs now. The uh, SHAP program, which is Senior Citizen Homeowner Assistance Program, um, some loans that are done through NHS, uh, and a small program called the Homeowner Assistance Program, um, all of which serve very specific segments of the homeowner population. The programs are fragmented. They, are not, they have not been updated to reflect um, current needs. They are, have been chronically underfunded, so they really have not worked very well. So the idea behind Home Fix is to take all three of those programs and, and look at how we can better serve a broader range of existing homeowners. I think we will absolutely continue to target senior citizens because we know there are a significant number of low and moderate income seniors who have been homeowners for many years. The issue for them is repairs as opposed to you know paying mortgage or things like that. And in many cases, we believe that, that mortgage costs are paid off, but you can't remain as homeowner if you uh, have repairs that you can't fund. Um, so we want to be able to help people address their full spectrum of needs. That can be repair needs. It may mean arrears. Uh, it may mean working with a financial counselor so that they are better able to weather the storms going forward. Um, so we are looking at all of the tools that we can pull together to do that. We're really trying to um, take an informed approach. So as I say, we are doing a lot of interviews with stakeholders right now so that we can launch something that addresses that full spectrum. All right. So, um, what, uh, when people come to my district, they're usually surprised because uh, of how, how loud I am on certain issues. They're surprised to learn that probably 80 percent of my district is one or two family homeowners. So this is something um, that is, is very germane in my district and, and personal to me. Uh, how, are you, how are you focused on what data set do you use to get to those seniors? How do you know there's seniors there? How do you know there are senior, seniors in crisis? Is it just people come to you? Do you proactively go out, and how do you do that? Again, with the caveat that we are still in program design phase here, I anticipate that we'll work with community groups. Um, we have done that thus far. As I say, it has been a little clunky and needs to be modernized, but that we will have nonprofit partners on the ground who know, um, who know who is out there, who can do outreach. We work, among others, very closely with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. They have a very broad citywide reach um, because they are also working with neighborhood-based partners so that there can be a robust referral network. Um, you know, Certainly, we welcome people coming to us and we put information on our website and things like that, but we realize that's not the most necessarily most effective way for people to hear about our programs. Do we have, does the city have data sets that can help identify in particular Vulnerable seniors. Um, I, you know, I think we we are going to have to use every tool that we have, and we will use the data that we can find. I think we're we're still exploring that. What we we're setting up routine, regular meetings with the Department for the Aging, so that we are making sure that we are plugging into the networks and the information that they have. Um, you know, identifying who is. Who is a homeowner? Who is low income? Who might need that? Like, I think we can probably do a fair amount with administrative data, but at the end of the day, it's going to need some on-the-ground footwork as well. Oh, I have one more question, and I go to my uh, colleagues. Well, what level of home ownership is the ideal target, particularly given the challenges of New York City? Is there, is there a numerical target, or is it just making home ownership more accessible? Uh, I, at this point, we have not put in a numerical target on it. We're focused on making home ownership more accessible. Um, for many extremely low and very low income households, rent, making sure that we have affordable and safe and sustainable rental opportunities is a more viable approach than home ownership. So the Housing New York plan, very transparently is focused on renters. We think home ownership is an important piece of the puzzle, but we're not putting targets on it right now. I, I will say one 
one of the several good things about the plan is that it did focus on preservation of, of rentals, which is something that the previous plans had ignored. And the last administration's plan finally accepted toward the end of, the, uh, of their term. But it obviously is the thing we need the most. Uh, we won't build ourselves way out of the problem. And you're right, rentals are just accessible. But, but I, I do think we, we may want to think about some specific goals for home ownership, even if it's based on the challenges of New York. Um, so hopefully you'll think about that a little bit. We, we'll go to my colleagues for five minutes of questions each, starting with Council Member Grodenchik, followed by Council Member Chin, and we've been joined by Council Member Mendez. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I can't say I've enjoyed four years on this committee, but I have enjoyed uh, two plus years. So thank you for all your courtesies. Is this our last meeting? I'm, I'm like on autopilot when it comes to housing and buildings, so I'm just like I know I have to show up. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. How are you today? Fine, thank you. I just want to ask you um, a question um, regarding property taxes, and I know you're not the Department of Finance, but property taxes, I have maybe 20,000 co-op units in my district, maybe more, uh, what I would consider affordable housing with few exceptions. Uh, when I walk out of my district office, I'm standing in, my DO is in an 1,800 unit co-op. Across the street is about 800 units. That way there's 800 more and down the block there's about 800 more. So just in eyesight, I have over 4,000 units or close to 4,000 units. Um, and I'm concerned because property taxes are eating up a greater and greater and greater share of what the co cooperators have to pay every month to sustain themselves. And I want to know if the property tax is on co-ops, which can be wildly unstable. I know that's not HPD's fault. I'm not blaming you. But as we go forward and we try to um, provide more affordable home ownership, um, do you, meaning HPD, do you figure this into the equation? How does that work? So I'm, I'm not going to address the broader topic of, of property Please taxes. Please don't, because Thank we you. might be here for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, but I will say that property tax exemptions are one of the really valuable tools that we have um, when we work with co-ops to make sure to preserve affordability. Um, we are more than happy to work with a co-op to um, put a tax exemption in place in exchange for ongoing affordability. This is something we do on a very regular basis. Um, you know, so, f uh, and, and we have a fair degree of latitude in how that gets structured. So uh, Article 11 exemption, for example, is for households that are up to 165% of AMI. So for a co-op that is serving a moderate income, middle income uh, community, as long as the homeowners are willing to exchange some of the upside of the, the future sales proceeds, we are more than happy to put a tax exempt, work with the council to put a tax exemption in place. Okay, we did provide some relief yesterday, and I thank the chairman for that with the J51 program, but um, perhaps you and I should have a meeting offline so I can better understand what programs are available. I would appreciate that. I would be more than happy. And I will ask my office to follow up with you okay. so that we can meet so I can understand that. Um, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for the, the time. I'm going to release the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, I'm joined by Councilmember Rodriguez, um, Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Commissioner, for your testimony. I know in your testimony you talked about um, the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, about designed to accelerate the process of converting buildings in our tenant interim lease program into affordable co-op. And I think that that's great because a lot of um, the tenants in those buildings are looking forward to that. But can you also talk about, because uh, I didn't see it in your testimony, the, HS, uh, the HFDC, the one that's already um, turned into affordable co-op. So how is HPD really looking at this asset? you know, this group of homeowner and to be able to help them to make sure that they can maintain their affordable home ownership. Good, mo good morning. Um, I'm, my name is Anne Marie Hendrickson and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Asset and Property Management. Good morning, Councilmember Chin. 
Um, in terms of the HDFC co-ops, um, we work with the HDFC co-ops um, you know, all the time. We have a training contract with the Neighborhood Housing Services. They provide training um, in maintenance and budget planning for the HDFC co-ops. And what we do is try to work with them to structure a budget that is going to allow them to be long-term affordable. Um, as Deputy Commissioner um, Park spoke about, they also get a tax exemption, which we also use to kind of help them maintain affordability, try to keep maintenance as low as possible. Um, but again, training is always offered by HPD and by our training contractor for all of the HDFC co-ops. I, I guess with that is that I just want to make sure that HBC, uh, HPD have the resources and the personnel because I think even in your testimony you talk about it's not one size fit all. I think with HEFC there's, there's different you know, needs and, uh, and different resources that can help them. And I really urge HPD to really continue to look at how individualize some of the situation, but the, the goal is to make sure that we preserve um, these affordable home ownership uh, in our community and really look at different you know, options to really help them. Um, I know in my district, uh, we work with uh, Cooper Square, and they have a very successful uh, community land trust, and they work with a large group of building that was, uh, I guess, formerly HCFC. So there are models out there, and we're really looking at that. The other question I have is that, I mean, HBD also have this uh, acquisition program where you help nonprofit purchase when stabilized building. Now those building, I mean, are you looking at those building as future home ownership opportunities uh, for the resident? Because some of the acquisition program, um, the income level is around 80% AMI and maybe more, right? So could those building um, down the road, instead of just rental, uh, be um, transfer into home ownership opportunity for um, the resident in those buildings? Sure. Uh, thanks. For, thank you for the question. Um, at this point, the vision for the Neighborhood Pillars Program, which is the, the program that you mentioned, is focused on making sure that we don't lose that rental stock. This is what we think of as our de facto affordable housing that is really at risk of speculators. Um, but I think, I think there could be, under certain circumstances, a longer term home ownership option there. And I will say that uh, many of the nonprofit organizations that we're talking to extensively about neighborhood pillars are also some of the same organizations that are involved in the CLT conversation. So um, I anticipate that these acquisitions are going to be challenging, and so the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we don't lose them as affordable housing stock, but that the, there will be opportunity for secondary conversations about the long-term um, options for those properties. Okay, just to follow up with that is that there are, you know, nonprofits for the last maybe 20 more, 30 years have uh, built affordable housing and those are the ones that's been providing affordable um, rental you know, to low-income families. And those housing stock could be another potential of creating home ownership opportunities because the residents there have been long-term residents. And so if they were given the opportunity for home ownership, I think that is something that when we talked about in the testimony about you know, stabilizing community, help building wealth, those are the, the building that might be potential building because they've been in the program for more than 15 years. Right. Um, so that's something that I think we should really look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a look at that. Thank you. Uh, and Councilmember Mendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. I have four questions, so I'm going to get them out first. Um, one is, in your testimony, you refer to rehabilitating and extending affordability for large Micheloma co-ops. What defines large? Um, you talk about um, inclusionary housing, and I want to know if you're doing anything with inclusionary housing bonuses, which have been the bane of my existence. Um, 
You talk about the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. I would like to know how many till buildings are in track and at what phase they're in in um, the ANCP program. And I think I have another question I can't remember. Let's go with that. All right. That, that should keep us busy. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Julie Walpert. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Chalama uh, Program. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you find to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Sure. So the Michelama, large Michelama co-ops are basically all of our Michelamas are large, and I think that that was just the, um, the term that was used in the testimony, but we are targeting all of the Michelamas. Okay. All right, uh, inclusionary. Um, at this point, we, we have the MIH program that is in place. I know even within the people in this room, there are some differences of opinion on that, but uh, it, is, it is, has been launched. We are seeing projects, both 100% affordable projects that are, um, include MIH components, and now we are increasingly starting to see some mixed income, mixed market affordable projects as well. Um, at this point, we are not contemplating significant changes to the MIH program in the near future. We, in addition, we have the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program. Um, I think when MIH was passed, we committed to the council that we would be looking at the um, voluntary inclusionary and recommending some changes and we've had a lot of analysis going on internally on that and we will be coming back to to talk to the council about that going forward um, we do use it, inclusionary housing tends to be typically a rental program um, but but there have been a number of inclusionary home ownership projects over the last few years i am just pulling up my notes so that i can give you the exact number of uh, we have, it has been relatively small, so we have created a total of uh, 30 inclusionary home ownership units uh, through Housing New York uh, to date. You're talking about the ANCP? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, that was all inclusionary housing. So with ANCP, um, we, there are 134 buildings in the pipeline right now. Uh, 50 of those have been assigned. 140 mapped. units or buildings? Sorry, 134 buildings. That is uh, 2,105 units. 50 buildings have been matched with a developer. So that means that HPD and the Tenant Association and the developer are working closely in the pre development phase. Um, so planning the layouts of the units, right, as I'm sure you know, the, the tenants both review and approve the lay, any layout changes that are happening. Um, there's all the very technical aspects of the pre-development process, getting building permits, things like that, lining up the financing, um, and also working on a relocation plan because the work in ANCP is extensive enough that, that tenants need to be relocated during the construction period. So that's, I, I believe I said 50 buildings, 691 units. Um, that leaves 84 buildings with about 1,400 units that have not yet been assigned to developers. Of that 84, 27 are in what we call pre-engagement, which means the Tenant Association and HPD are working closely uh, with those tenant associations to under make sure that the tenants understand the process that's going to be coming up and figuring out which developer is the most appropriate uh, for that particular project. That's 27 buildings, 536 units. And we have 57 buildings with 878 units that are somewhat further out in the pipeline. Um, I remembered my other question. Okay. Sure. So um, there's an issue that I've worked with HPD on. It's my HDFC rentals that look like and act like HDFC co-ops. And I want to know what, if anything, is being done to um, help put them in a pipeline for home ownership. And I just want to add that on the vo voluntary inclusionary housing, it is the bonuses that's been an issue for me because 
It's sold to anybody, and often it's been developers with a bad, bad track record in the community who have been harassing people. I've advocated, since I'm leaving office, I'm going to give a little speech. I've been advocating for trying to figure out how we can do an RFQ for these developers. I think it's something that we could and should do and that we can figure out a way that we do it within the Constitution so we're not depriving anyone of their constitutional rights to property. Um, but I think it would be something worth looking at because egregious developers are then getting these air rights, expanding their buildings, and harassing the, ins the existing residents of those buildings. So um, HDFC Rentals. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Hold on. Okay. Do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Um, in terms of the HDFC rentals that are interested in becoming cooperatives, there are a small number that have expressed interest and we have put together a small pilot. Um, what I'd like to do, council members, speak specifically to you about which buildings you're speaking about and I can let you know at what stage they are in terms of making that transition. Thank you. And any response to the RFQ on the record or off the record? <laughs> uh, it's something that I think I should take back to our legal department. I, you know, MIH, VIH are very heavily structured programs, as I'm sure you know, and I don't want to say anything out of turn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me know if any other councilmen want to go on for a, a second round. We've been joined by Councilmember Ulrich. I do have a few questions of my own. Um, what is the progress of the recently announced Mitchell Lama reinvestment program? How many developments agreed to participate? How many are still considering buyouts? Um, in terms of the, the new Mitchell Lama reinvestment program, that actually was also just introduced um, within the last month. So we have, um, I think, one or two um, developments that are, have been talking to HDC about that. and. Um, we have plans um, after the, in the winter to um, to go out actively and talk to um, to potential developments that may be interested. We did actually have a meeting um, at HDC with the corporate attorneys who deal with the Mitchellamas to introduce the program, and, and there seemed to be interest. Since last year's hearing on Mitchellama housing, how many uh, Mitchellama comas have been bought out? Um, we've had uh, four buyouts since the, I think that, you know, we had talked about that there were five in the pipeline, four of those bought out. What is the long-term strategy with regards to Mitchell Lamo? Although the reinvestment plan allows developments to extend their terms, isn't this just a temporary band-aid? Won't developments consider buyouts once the extension elapses? Well, so we have been um, successful in preserving a large number of our Mitchell Lamas, like in particular the co-ops we have 61 co-ops, 52 of which have, are, are preserved. Some of the, um, some of the restrictions um, end in the next two or three years, and those are actually the ones that the Michelama Reinvestment Program that we're targeting, the ones that, um, that end in the next two or three years. But, you know, in the last um, three, since 2014, we've been able to preserve I actually have co-op numbers. Um, oh, actually, these are not. These are so we've been able to preserve 47 developments, for which are 18,000 units. Those are co-ops or rentals? Those are a mixture of both. Um, so, and those are long-term preservations. Those are between 20 and 35 years. I think one of them is even a 40-year um, preservation. So, you know, we're constantly coming up with tools to um, to do long-term preservation. Our, we extend our, our tax exemptions. We um, offer good financing. You know, we're really working hard to um, to maintain the Mitchellama portfolio. How many buys have there been of rental buildings? Um, there's been one buyout in rentals. Um, and some other questions that mostly pertain to the rental side. Um, How has HPD oversight of the Mitchellama wait list increased or otherwise changed since the previous council hearing? Right. So that actually pertains to both the rentals and the co-ops. We, um, we're excited. We actually have a, a few new initiatives um, in place. We now have Mitchellama Connect, which is um, a partner to a part of Housing Connect, 
where the lotteries are held online that you know people can apply online they can also apply you know by and paper if they want but we can you know so we automatically draw the lotteries um, which makes the whole process a, a lot more um, efficient and uh, and easier to to just move the the wait lists we um, we also have a on part of Mitchellama Connect a new web page where we um, we show the last number of that we've approved on the wait list and the date that we've approved it to give people an idea of like where they stand in terms of of when their number will be called so that they'll be you know ready for that all of that is online that's online sir yes is there is there so the entire wait list and the process of how people get on it are now online and can be looked at no sir so okay. the the wait lists are not online yet. Okay. Um, that's you know that's a, a longer term initiative which we are very you know hopeful to do. But what we we have online currently are the actual lotteries are online, and the last wait list number that was approved. So but, if we approve number seventeen, and I'm number nineteen, I know okay I, you know my number's coming up and I should you know keep an eye out. Okay. And who's who's doing the monitoring on the other side? At the part that's not online. So HPD continues to monitor, um, and so and that's another initiative that we put forward. So we now require proof of mailing. So if I'm now, um, you know, my staff is reviewing the next person on the wait list, you know, an application that comes in, and they're number 22, we look to make sure that number 21 was offered the apartment, which we have always done in the past. But if 21 now, you know, there's there's no application for 21. That we require proof of mailing that you know we you know they've either rejected or that they you know or that they've at least they may have moved and didn't you know provide follow-up but that you know that there's a record of what happened to the people on the wait list prior to the person that you know that I'm approving so if I'm number 21 and Commissioner Park is number 22 and uh, online it will say that number 20 got it so I am up now because I'm number 21? Yes. And so the next one will have to say number 21. Right. So, you know, just with a little bit of um, caution here, because on open waiting lists, veterans have preference. So 20, if it's an open waiting list and, you know, I just approved 20 and then a veteran comes on, then 21 won't get it next. Um, you know, and again, we'll monitor our waiting list so to, to, to insert that a veteran, you know, came onto the list. So we'll say number 120 veteran well so we don't mark that it's veteran we'll keep because you'll the number 21 will be next you know on the list and if we start doing you know we wanted to make it as transparent as possible so you're still going to be 21 and you know it, so if it'll, get, if it'll take you it'll just take you a little bit longer to get that, that so apartment. if 20 came and i was supposed to be number 21 and i see another name or the, the what's going to come if the veteran comes how would it how would so it won't be marked at all and you will still be number 21 and so once that veteran gets the list you'll still be number 21 and you'll so get that I, no one will partner. see that a veteran got it. no one will see that it will be um on the, there's wait lists that are posted at the development so you can see that you know that where that is we've just tried to make it as um as straightforward as possible on the website so that people will know that you know i'm because yeah. you don't know I mean, the Mitchell Lama vacancies don't necessarily happen very often. People don't, once they get an apartment, they don't like to leave. How, so, so, how, um, who else gets priority beside veterans? Um, internal transfers. So internal transfers actually get priority over veterans. So if I'm on a studio wait list, then you, you know, then there are no internal transfers. And who monitors the internal transfer? A HPD does. So how, how do we guarantee there's no skipping happening there? Because again, we we're, we pre-approve anyone who moves into the uh, into the unit. So if if I'm looking at an internal, if I'm looking at an external transfer, I want to make an, an external application. I want to make sure that there's no internal person who would have priority. So I appreciate there's more stuff online. I think there was some concerns about internal transfers to begin with. I'm just trying to figure out why can't we do all of the machinations online. So if there's an internal transfer, just put that online. If there's a veteran that comes in, put that online. Why, why do we have to do it only in the, um, only in the um, developments themselves? Why can't that be done online? 
I think they were just trying to make this as, as you know, straightforward as possible that people can look at the website, know that, you know, I'm going to be next. We have the, um, the caveat that if it's an internal transfer or veterans have priority. So, you know, we have that information online so that people can understand that. But they're still going to be the next person outside of those two pr um, priorities. And is there, I just know there's still major concern about the skipping. And so I'm liking the direction it's going. But I know, I'm, I'm looking at a question that somebody gave specifically about internal transfers. So they're still concerned about it. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a barrier to, I understand you're trying, it sounds like you're trying to make it as clear as possible. But I think by doing that, you're still leaving people assuming that there's shenanigans going on. So we want to make sure that that, that assumption is cleared up. I think it will be easier if we can just put online when there's an internal transfer so everyone can see it when the veteran, when anyone skips the line for whatever reason. Is okay, there I'll, I'll take that back to our technical people and see you know, how we can make that work. Okay. And maybe one of my last gifts can be to put in an <laughs> LS request to try to make sure that we have that online uh, just to help. I, again, I, I just need to make sure that, you know, technically how that will work out. Okay. Right? Um, I just would, you know, if there's a barrier, I want to know now if there's something I think about, but it seems that that will alleviate a lot of concerns so everybody can be looking at the same thing because uh, a lot of concerns happen when people just can't see and they see people popping in. That causes a lot of unnecessary confusion. Um, what procedures are in place for Mitch Lama board training and what, HPD, what are HPD procedures to ensure board members receive necessary training? So we're actually excited about that as well. We um, have implemented a new co-op board training process uh, 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 program where we have um, an in-house <laughs> trainer who um, will train co-op boards, um, you know, the Mitchell co-op boards. So we've done, we in, um, instituted it last spring. Um, it's continuing, um, we took the summer off, we're continuing the fall and we have dates up through March um, to have the boards come in and, and be trained. So, um, and we've actually gotten some very positive feedback on that. Uh, there are a couple more questions. I have some about two or three HDFC questions I'm going to ask. But before I do that, I'm going to go to, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Levine and Rosenthal, and I'll give five minutes for Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Chair Williams. Good morning. Great Good morning. to see you. Thank you for this important topic. I know that you have touched on, on the very important sector of HDFCs in a few of the previous questions. Um, I'm just curious to know why it was, it was given so little reference in your opening statement before I get to some of my questions on the topic. Does that reflect a, a move away from emphasizing the program? Not at all. I think we've been here a number of times talking about HDFCs, both in council hearings and we have done quite a number of individual council follow-ups specifically on HDFCs. And we have some new initiatives that, in, that are in the Housing New York 2.0 that we haven't had the opportunity to talk to you about. And so we wanted to make sure that we were giving those attention as well. Understood. I think that HDFCs have, on the whole, been an incredibly successful program. Granted, there are challenges, and, um, and some, some co-ops in particular are, are uh, in distress. But as a whole, it's just been, I've seen it in my district, an incredible vehicle for low-income families to, to achieve the dream of home ownership. And, and they, they've, they've turned around whole blocks and beyond in my district. I've seen it again and again. So I'm, I'm a big believer in the program. Um, you have been uh, deliberating for a year or more on, on a, a plan to revamp the regulatory agreements with, state, with HDFCs. And at the moment, it's a patchwork. Uh, some don't even have regulatory agreements. Um, and we've talked about this in previous hearings, but I just wanted to give you a chance to update us on, on where you're at on those deliberations. Sure. Good morning, sir. Um, in terms of HDFC reform, um, right now we are on listening mode. And we have paused. Um, as you know, there was a lot of feedback that we had gotten from our approach to how we want to structure the regulatory agreement. And we wanted to take a pause and get more input from shareholders and from people on the ground before we came out with any sort of revised um, version of that. So what we'd like to do is come out in the beginning of the new year. But again, we're still conducting some meetings and still conducting some listening tours to get that feedback because you know, we wanted to make a collaborative process, something that everybody can live with, something that everybody sees as achieving the same goal that we all have in terms of extending affordability 
And I totally agree with you that the HDFCs have been kind of the backbone of the community, and that's something we want to ensure remains viable. And so by listening towards it, are you actually going to building to building, or how are these being conducted? Well, um, right now what we've done is we've met with community boards. Um, they've actually kind of galvanized a group of shareholders and brought our, their feedback. So we met with Community Board 10. Um, we met with some of the Lower East Side shareholders. Some of the various coalitions, you know, that have been formed by um, shareholders, we have asked them to come in to meet with us and are, again, always open to going to them to hear their feedback. So that's how we've been trying to get that outreach done. Got it. And do you have a schedule for when you're going to move from the listening, listening tour into uh, a new round of proposals? Yeah. Um, again, we would like to come out with something um, in the beginning of the new year. Okay. okay in terms of, um, you know, our revised proposal, we have some thoughts. But again, there are still some kind of main stakeholders that we haven't heard from that we'd like to hear from before actually putting that um, formal plan out in the new year. Oh, I appreciate that, and I, I truly appreciate you all listening to the people who are experts on this topic, which are the current shareholders, which have been living this day, day in and day out for, for decades in some cases. And, you know, I think that we share the broad goals, which are to help shore up struggling mm -hmm. cooperatives, and there are many out there, there's mm -hmm. many in my district. There are a minority of the total, maybe it's 25 percent, uh, give or take, um, but there are co-ops which need help. And um, I think we want a solution that also um, respects the differences amongst the many different uh, HDFCs and respects some that are succeeding mm -hmm. and that are following the rules and are, are both preserving affordability in the way that we hope the program would, but also are allowing shareholders to build a little bit of equity. You know, that's the balance that we're seeking. And, th and there are co-ops which have done that at, to, to great effect. Um, and we know that there are some that have been skirting the rules and selling at very high prices, and that, that's also something that we have to fix. So um, there are problems there. A refrain that I think you've heard a lot on your listening tour is to avoid a one-size-fits-all uh, solution, and a solution that would work for a struggling HDFC might not be one that would work for a thriving one. And a solution that would work for HDFC, which is following all the rules and doing all the paperwork and has good governance, might not work for another one that is uh, skirting the rules and, and therefore selling at uh, inflated prices. So my time is up. Um, I think we probably share those broad principles. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and to stakeholders, and I look forward to uh, continuing this process with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Councilmember Rosenthal. Thanks so much, Chair Williams. Um, thank you all for coming here. Uh, some of my favorite HPD people to work with. So it's really nice to see you. Appreciate your holding this hearing and your testimony. Um, I would say the one thing that I think is frustrating for my constituents and Deputy Commissioner Walpert? Assistant. Assistant. Hmm, but deputy sounds good. <laughs> Assistant Commissioner Walpert um, has assured me over and over again about the buildings in my district. But in general, um, I, one of the complaints that I hear often is a lack of transparency and a desire by the tenants to know what's going on on an ongoing basis. And I know there are challenges to doing that on your side and you've got financing issues and um, purchasing issues, but I just wanted to put that be in your bonnet to think about how we can be more transparent for people who um, live in uh, Michelama's own Michelama co-ops um, and what is coming down the pike for them. And, you know, I mean, there are two buildings in my district that we've talked about where they just don't, they're getting misinformation from their board. And so there's this challenge between the board that they elected and the reality on the ground and then the reality from HPD's point of view. Um, so I'm always curious about how we can increase transparency in, in that regard. 
So I think that's actually something that we can work with you about. I think if you're talking about transparency in terms of the boards may be interested in pursuing a buyout, um, then um, you know, with the new um, HDC Mitchell Alma Reinvestment Program, that I think there's some concern that the shareholder, that this is really a board decision, but the shareholders may not know that these exist. And so maybe we can work together to, um, to provide a, that you can provide a forum for us, you know, with, with HDC to come out and, and talk to just Mitchell Amish shareholders in general and with the boards there as well. But, you know, HPD can't just go to a Mitchell Amish without being invited by a board, but if you were to invite us, um, I think that that actually might be a great solution. So in other words, having a community forum on it. Yes, I think that would be great. Whoever shows up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, there are some wonderful, amazing looking young people out there from Riverdale Avenue Middle School in Brownsville, Brooklyn. How are you guys doing? You all right? You can wave. All right. You enjoying yourself? Is it all you ever hoped and dreamed? <laughs> well, we're glad to see you here. I thank you for taking in some, um, some civics and thank you to the teachers for bringing them out. I don't think there's enough going on in the schools and I'm happy that you're here. Um, as far as the HDFCs, we obviously have a, a long way to go. Um, I do want to say, uh, I have to say, of, of the many issues, this is one where HPD really responded um, to uh, the council members who had the most in the districts that um, did a lot of work, and to this committee and this chair in particular. There was a real response in a way that I haven't seen on a lot of issues to at least listen and try to correct. So I want to make sure we acknowledge that on the record, and I thank you for it. Of course, uh, there are still some folks that uh, have some angst, rightfully so. We have a, a long way to go, but I just want to make sure I acknowledge that. Now, just for intents and purposes, it seems to me that, at least for the time being, there was a halting in moving forward uh, on the foreclosures while this um, listening tour, for lack of a better word, is happening. Is that correct? What was happening with, with the foreclosures that many people were worried about? Is there a pause right now while you're uh, correcting that? with the biggest point being that one size didn't fit all for some of the regulatory agreements that were uh, being pushed forward on some of them? Um, good morning, sir. So HDFC reform wasn't really focused on um, the co-ops that were in foreclosure. HDFC reform is for those co-ops that did not have a regulatory agreement with HPD, which are many of them. Only 20% of the HDFC co-ops that were developed through HPD have a regulatory agreement. So that's HDFC reform, and that's something, again, we're still mulling, still trying to figure out what we would like to propose in terms of getting feedback from other shareholders. So there's a pause on the reform that was put there for the listening portion to continue. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's happening with the foreclosures? With the foreclosures, I think you're referring to third-party transfer round 10, which is an ongoing round right now. Okay, um, and that's not a foreclosure action that's targeted for co-ops. It's foreclosures of distressed property, um, properties that had rental, I'm sorry, had arrears, whether they were rental or co-ops. There are a subset of co-ops that are in third party transfer. And um, again, we, at this time, we have not, we filed for judgments, but no judgments have been received. So there is still an opportunity for those co-ops to come and enter into payment plans and get themselves out of that foreclosure action. How many of those, how many of them are there? Currently, there are 75 HDFC co-ops that were active as of November, and that number was down from 84. So actually, nine of those co-ops um, were able to go into payment plans mm -hmm. and come out of that action. And um, HDFC co-ops that are in the current in-rim action right now have a total of about $64 million in delinquent charges. So I just want to make sure we're talking on the... Um about the same thing, so I'm going to read some of the questions I got from the coalition directly. Mm -hmm. so I want to make sure we're talking about the same building. So the HDFC coalition and the Brooklyn HDFC coalition on a voluntary basis have been doing outreach and filing Article 9 tax amnesty application with successful financial plans to stabilize the co-ops that I believe we're referring to. They've reached 12 HDFCs on the list, but more time is needed to reach the other 55. Does that sound like we're talking about the same group of Buildings? Yeah, I think I think we are, and I think we're talking about Article 11 because um, what we yes, did. Yes, I'm what, sorry. Yeah, no, I didn't read my Roman numerals correctly. No problem. The one is on the other side. Yes, Article 11. Well, just um, again, just um, as background, what HPD did was we actually delayed doing the filings for the judgments to give the co-ops um, additional time to file an Article 11 application, 
And actually, right now, we have 20 co-ops that have filed an Article 11 um, application. You know, the checklist is pretty extensive, and you know, all the checklist is not complete. But it's good to see that some of those co-ops are actively trying to figure out how to put themselves back together. Um, but that's not going to delay us, okay, from moving forward with the action. This action started in 2015, okay, and we're now almost in 2018. So the judgments will be filed, you know, will be received soon. And it's still, even after the judgment is filed, the co-op still has an opportunity to enter into a payment plan with the Department of Finance or DEP to come out of the action. Can you explain that a little bit, what the time they have after the judgment is filed? Um, after the judgment is filed, it's what we call the mandatory redemption period, and that's a four-month um, time period in which they would have to put down at least 50 percent okay. um, down with DOF or DEP on a payment plan or pay in full. I mean, so realistically speaking, that probably won't happen because they won't, probably won't have 50 percent of, well, of And that's percent. why I think what the coalitions are doing now are encouraging um, you know, the co-ops to go into a payment plan now. Yeah. where they require less than that 50 percent. It sounds like they're saying they've reached out to some of them, but they're having trouble reaching out to the rest of them. Well, again, you know, we've conducted outreach as well. We've done robocalls. We've had NHS. Um, we've had UHAB um, reach out. Again, this started in 2015, so we did try to reach out to everyone that we could. And again, we still encourage that anybody who is interested, get into a payment plan. If you get into a payment plan, the clock stops. You get pulled out of the action. And help me understand the difference between the one that we're talking about here in this building just for on the record, and the ones that we're talking about who were part of the reforms that were pushing them. Well, again, all the, all the co-ops that are part of reform are not necessarily in third-party transfer. Mm -hmm. These were just co-ops that didn't have a regulatory agreement. Mm -hmm. Some subset of them could be in third-party transfer. I'm not quite sure what the crossover is. But the HDFC reform is really targeted to get out to about 1,200 co-ops citywide, while third-party transfer at this point there's only 75 co-ops that are actually in that action. Now, my concern, even from the, from the previous hearing, was in particular the people who were promised something and then weren't delivered that. And so I know there's been a lot of work to, to keep that promise. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to do some more. I appreciate that a, the city, the HPD, finally acknowledged that that promise was made. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't kept, and we're trying to do what we can to keep it. I've also said there, there are some fiduciary responsibilities to the upkeep of a building, so we have to find the middle ground there. So I would say I'm sure that um, the committee and uh, even if I'm not the one here and the members who are uh, most affected will continue to push to do what we can to protect the, the, the buildings and the people who live in the buildings to make sure the promises are kept. I will say, and I'm sure I'm going to hear from some of the HGFC folks after, there, there is going to come a point where the building isn't solvent, and we got to figure that out. We can't just allow the building to continue to go into disrepair. And so, if that, can't, if we can't figure it out, if people can't pay for it, it's hard to continue to say stop, 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 stop. And so, that is a very real thing as well. And so, I, I do think HPD has moved a long way from what they were going to do at the beginning um, when we we're talking about this to where they are now. Hopefully, we can push them a little further. But on the other end. There is a real financial um, responsibility that has to be met or else people are not going to live in, in properties that they should be living in that are not habitable. So both of those things are true, and we've got to figure out uh, where we end up. Um, would HPD consider supporting a working group requested by the HDFC Coalition and the Brooklyn HDFC Coalition consisting of HPD, the Department of Finance, Department of DEP, and our coalitions to review? and make transparent the foreclosure. Obviously, you can't answer for the other departments, but you can answer for yourself. Well, if I'm answering for myself, for HPD, I could say yes. Okay, I can't you know, necessarily speak for sister agencies, but I think it's, you know, it's in the administration's best effort, best interest to be working collegially with the, with the shareholder group and trying to figure out ways to either keep them solvent or have them move to rent-stabilized properties. Um, uh, the HD, just, I'm going to read what I have here. HDFC Coalition has discovered nu numerous bu bureaucratic errors, indecipherable finance and water bills, questionable charges, and conflicting information given at customer service centers that hobble on HDFC's ability to tackle their arrears. They have said yes, they will be interested in doing a working group, so hopefully that will be followed up on. Um, and so I, I just want to say, just so we're clear also on the record, that so after the foreclosure, it uh, unfortunately home ownership is lost, but it folks do remain in their homes as rent-stabilized um, tenants. 
Yes, so under the third party transfer program, every, no one is displaced. Everybody remains in the building that they are. The buildings are transferred ultimately to a nonprofit uh, or other mi otherwise mission oriented developer. HPD finances the rehab. There is a long term affordability regulatory agreement put on it, and nobody is displaced from their home. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't have any other questions. I haven't seen any colleagues sign up for uh, round two. And we've been joined by Council Member Torres. Don't know, did you, did you have any questions? Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure this term. Uh, whatever uh, it is I'm doing after, I'm looking forward to working on the same issues. So uh, thank you very much. Um, there are some people who are going to testify, so hopefully someone will stick around to hear the concerns. That's going to be you? All right, congratulations. Thank you very much. We have uh, Holly Chu from uh, Borough President Gail Brewer's office, who is going to provide some testimony. We're going to provide the Borough President with some courtesy of uh, four minutes for a testimony, and uh, everyone else after will be uh, two minutes. So there's only five people who have signed up, so we're going to try to fit everybody on one panel after uh, Ms. Chu is finished. That will be Will Bucklery, HGFC Coalition, John McBride, HGFC Coalition, Glorianne Kirsten, HGFC Coalition, Sylvia, I believe it's Tyler, HGFC Co-ops, and Leo Goldberg, Center for NYC Neighborhoods. They'll be joining us after Ms. Chu. Ms. Chu, um, can you raise your right hand, please? Do your friend to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Um, I do, yes. And you can begin. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to read testimony on behalf of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, I'm just going to focus on some of the pertinent sections in the different programs that she wants to mention. Um, so in terms of um, homeownership in general, um, specifically with HPD homeownership programs, um, so I, Gail Brewer, who is writing this testimony, believe that it is important to clarify what can often be misunderstood as a tension between property ownership and the role of public oversight agencies such as HPD. Um, so when an affordable homeownership project involves the transfer of public properties or government subsidies, responsible stewardship takes on the added obligation of ensuring long-term affordability throughout the life of the subsidy or the restrictions placed on the property. And this is the understanding that the Borough President is making the following um, recommendations. So for HDFC cooperatives, um, in terms of HPD's proposed regulatory agreement that has been proposed since last spring. Um, I can start after the bullet point. It says, I support HPD's intent to preserve the long-term affordability of HDFC co-ops and believe that the regulatory agreement is a necessary mechanism to safeguard the availability and affordability of New York City's approximately 30,000 units of HDFC co-ops. Um, at the same time, um, the borough president has spoken with various HDFC stakeholders to understand their concerns regarding the proposed regulatory agreement. And based on the feedback, she has a couple of recommendations. One is the deeper property tax incentive that HPD is offering. Um, she believes that it should be 100% full tax exemption. Some HDFC co-ops located in neighborhoods with low real estate value are projected to have their property taxes reduced to zero under HPD's current proposal. Yet the properties located in high value real estate markets are the very ones that need deeper tax incentives in order to offset increased expenses upon adopting the regulatory agreement. Um, so the council, when working with HPD on agreement, should extend full tax exemption to all buildings upon entering regulation. And second, uh, retaining third party manager is an added expense for HDFC. While HPD allows for the waiver of outside managers, qualifying buildings must demonstrate a sufficient level of reserves. This requirement is particularly difficult to meet for HDFCs that have passed or current 25-year security agreement with HPD, 
which requires 40% of a sales profit to go toward HPD. Under this agreement, the building is unable to leverage profit splits to fund its reserves. So HPD should take this into consideration and allow for the management waiver of well-operated buildings that may not have the opportunity to build up reserves under the security agreement um, to be able to do so. And then under the foreclosure of third-party transfer, um, the borough president wrote a letter to HPD last in this fall, and then she has uh, additional recommendations. One is HPD has expressed commitment to work with TPT buildings that are willing to seek Article 11 tax exemption. As city council members, I urge the committee and your colleagues to ensure timely processing of Article 11 applications for these HDFC before the foreclosure moves forward for the current round. And then secondly, HPD must commit to better inform buildings, owners, and co-op um, for any upcoming round of TPT that will involve HDFC co-ops. Um, for the neighborhood in the uh, ANCP program, um, the biggest hurdle is the cost incurred from financing the roof to cellar rehab, which ends with a private debt that is laid on the building as they begin operating as an HDFC. So eliminating the private debt is possible through Reso A funding. Um, the borough president and council member Levine has done so for one building on 150th Street. Um, so she urges the members of this committee other city council members and her fellow borough presidents to consider what level of capital support can be possible to assist ANCP buildings so that when they um, begin operating, they can save hundreds of dollars um, in monthly maintenance. And then there's one point of clarification for Reso A funding. Under the new HPD policy as of 2016, Reso A funds administered by HPD are underwritten as repayable loans with deferred payment during the loan term, as opposed to forgivable loans as they had been prior to 2016. The intent behind this policy is to incentivize the extension of affordability at the end of a project's contract term, a goal which I support. However, when Reso A funds are used to establish HGFC co-ops, which are restricted as affordable housing for the life of the building by law, HPD should not recapture Reso A funds for principal or interest pay down. Um, and if it does, um, the borough president's recommendation um, is for HPD to put that money toward a dedicated fund for the development and preservation of affordable housing, preferably designated for the same council district or borough where the initial Reso A award originated. And then two additional recommendations for ANCP. One is um, the ability to have a management waiver just like HPD has included in the regulatory agreement draft for existing HDFCs. Um, currently, some of the tenants in the 150th Street have asked for this possibility, but HPD says it's not possible, um, even though the language has already been reviewed and approved by HPD's legal department for the proposed agreement for existing HDFCs. And then the second recommendation is to lower the standard AMI level for these ANCP buildings so that um, tenants moving in will not be significantly higher income than their counterparts. Um, and the borough president specifically wants to work with HRA to fill vacant units with responsible working families who need permanent housing in these ANCP. Um, and there are actually three recommendations for Michelama co-ops. One is for um, HPD's Article 11 tax exemption for these Mitchell Lama programs um, to consider that converting Article 2 housing Mitchell Lama to Article 11, which is HDFC, is not um, something that she accepts as uh, preserving affordability. Uh, while HPD presents Article 11 conversion as a preservation option, many of the Mitchell Lama stakeholders have informed her that sometimes the ability to make a profit upon unit sales actually propels co-op to explore Article 11 conversion. So she urges Article 11 to not be used to encourage Metro dissolution. Another recommendation- If you can um, just wrap up with Okay, that. sure. Um, second one summarizes succession rights, which um, she would want to have transparency, and also the consideration that sometimes the children who inherited these succession units um, can also become proponents for a private decision because of the ability to profit from it. So urges HPD to make rules regarding that. Um, and then for the third recommendation is for HPD to 
maintain a qualified list of management companies because there has been a lot of constituents um, coming to our office, her office saying that there are a lot of um, horror stories regarding the management companies. And then finally, there's a recommendation very briefly for the Home First Down Payment Assistance Program. In speaking with um, housing counselors, um, the impression is that um, even though this is very valuable and the HP, HPD staff assigned to the program are doing an excellent job, there seems to be a lack of capacity. So there are um, two staff right now handling all the closings, so there can be delay which can um, cause some of the people applying for the Home First Down Payment Assistance to have to choose to forego the um, subsidy or to not close at all and not purchase. All right. um, so thank you for the ability to read on her behalf, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take it back to her. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't think we have any questions at this time, but thank you so much. And please pass uh, thanks to the ball president as well. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to have one panel. If anyone else wants to testify, please make sure you fill out a slip with the Sergeant of Arms. Will Buckery. I'm sorry if I mess up anyone's name. HGFC Coalition. Thank you. John, um, John McBride. Glorianne Kirsten. Sylvia Tyler and Leo Goldberg. Leo Goldberg? I see. Oh, sure. So somebody's missing. I see Will Buckery. Is John McBride here? John McBride? Going once, twice for John McBride? He's not here yet. Okay. So we have a four. Can you each please raise your right hand? Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? All right. And we'll start with Mr. Buckery. We'll have two minutes each to give your testimony. Just press the button on. Uh, good morning, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Williams. Uh, council members, and thank, thank you all for everything that you, you're doing to help keep this the greatest city in the, in the world. Um, again, my name is Will Buckery. I live in 302 Convent Avenue. It's a Housing Development Fund Corporation building. I am a member of the uh, steering committee. Um, we're, we're, we're part 302 Convent which is right by City College, 142nd Street. We're part of that 73% of the HDFCs that are run well, uh, the, make full use of our damp tax allowance that helps keep our buildings, uh, uh, keep our co-op affordable. We have a 42-unit uh, co-op and I just wanted to uh, say that as far as uh, maintaining certain uh, standards of, of living and following the rules that were or guidelines uh, prescribed by HPD. Uh, giving a, an example, we recently uh, sold uh, one of our apartments at 302 and uh, a 1,700 square foot apartment, three bedrooms, two baths, and uh, we sold it. And transparency here, we sold it for $360,000. The uh, maintenance that goes with that is $1,100, and people say, half the people you meet say, my God, why is the maintenance uh, so low? And the other half say, why is the maintenance so high? Uh, the reason uh, the maintenance is so low is because of the damn tax allowance, which saves us over $125,000 a year. And without it, uh, we would lose affordability. That's why it's so low. The reason it's so high is because at $1,100 for this uh, seven room apartment, uh, we want to be able to pay our bills. We want to be able to pay our property taxes and our wa water and sewage bills. That's why it's so high. And the other reason, thanks to the dam, which we need for affordability, that's why it's so low. Um, my time is up? You can give a closing sentence. If you okay, uh, do a closing. 
Uh, I just want to say that in reaching out with the coalition in Bronx and Brooklyn, we talked to many families, many families who are just like us, and they're under foreclosure, uh, under the acts of foreclosure. When we talk to them, we find we're exactly the same, but for maybe poor management or failure to raise their uh, maintenances on a timely basis, they fell behind in water and sewage. And for that reason, families who vote, and we're all concerned about voting, families who are very concerned about getting their children, great-grandchildren, great into the best pre-K and uh, kindergarten schools. These families, just like us, do all the things, exact same things we're doing. So we need to have a conversation which involves them and HPD and everyone at the table where we talk about how we can solve this and get them back. Thank to, you. Like 302 Comet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gloria Ann Hussey Kirstein. I live in an HDFC on West 106th Street in Manhattan Valley where I've lived for 35 years. I'm also a senior citizen and a proud member of the HDFC coalition, which is composed entirely of HDFC shareholders who are working on a volunteer basis to try to promote policies in the city that are fair to the HDFC community. One of our biggest concerns today has been the 77 HDFC cooperatives that are on the chopping block facing foreclosure. 1,779 shareholders and their families will be losing their home ownership. 90% of them have had this home ownership from the 80s and 90s, meaning for 25 to 35 years. Our outreach has indicated that two-thirds of the shareholders who are facing foreclosure are senior citizens. And they are concentrated in areas of Harlem, Washington Heights, South Bronx, Bed-Stuy, East New York, the poorest communities of New York. And yes, they have stabilized those communities and stayed in those communities when nobody else wanted to buy into those communities. Those communities are now gentrifying, and now these people are losing their home ownership. HPD here today testified about all these foreclosure prevention programs that they are right now promoting. They're targeting senior citizens who own one to four unit homes. They're going to have a help desk. They're going to help with arrears. None of these programs were made available to HDFCs that were in distress. In fact, HPD says, we need a new regulatory agreement because so many HDFCs are in distress, yet one third of those HDFCs are on the chopping block to lose their home ownership altogether. So HPD really does kind of talk out of both sides of their mouth. I will uh, add, thank uh, the chair, Jemani Williams, for asking HPD about creating this working group that we asked for back on August 1st in a meeting with HPD. We asked for a working group with Department of Finance, with the Water Board, and HPD to make the foreclosure process more transparent and workable, and HPD a week later refused. So the fact that they said tonight here that they are now agreeable to this in front of you, we really thank you for that publicly since they refused us four months ago. So at this point, we have given uh, your sergeant at arms a copy of a resolution that we'd like the city council to adopt that would put a halt to the foreclosures, allow more time for outreach to these HDFCs, help them with the tax amnesty application process. We've been successful in doing 12, and we would like more time to, to save these homes. As HPD is testifying here, home ownership does lend stability to communities. Home ownership is worth saving. So these 77 co-ops, we need more time to save them. Thank you. Um, who, Sergeant, do you have a copy of the resolution? Oh, you, you gave one copy. Yeah, two. Okay. I only have one. Okay, then you can continue. Thank you. I can continue? Mm-hmm. Oh, what? He said you can continue. I can continue speaking? Uh, oh, the next. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, hello. I'm Sylvia Tyler. And I live in uh, West Harlem, 138th in Amsterdam, right across from City College. And we've been there. My daughter and I, we both moved there because she was, had a vision. She heard about the TIL program. So we moved in the building. We're on seventh floor. We walked up for years. There was no elevator. And with the TIL program, they were supposed to train the uh, tenants at the time, how to manage a building. You have had that job, and they didn't do a good job, and I think you have an HPD have to share greatly in uh, the fact that about over 25% of the buildings are struggling, and they are putting them into floor closure. And Anne-Marie said, sitting right here, Anne-Marie Hendrickson, 
said that her objective is not about the, the buildings and the foreclosure. It's the other buildings that she wants to sign a regulatory agreement. Now, I have been in uh, quite a few HDFCs, and there are some, a few luxury buildings that landlords abandon, and the tenants were there spending their money, saving them. And these buildings are valuable, and people have spent thousands of dollars. I myself had to get a home improvement loan. I didn't go in my kitchen for like three years. It was so deplorable. My bathroom had a, a hole in the wall. You could see into the next room and step into the next room. So I, being a, an educator, I also work in Harlem as an educator, and I used my resources and my confidence and my hard work for years to help bring the, the building and make it desirable. And at this point, a lot of people want to move into that neighborhood. It's gentrified. Our building is very gentrified. Some people have come into the building and bought, spent a lot more money than the $250 that I spent for a piece of crap that nobody wanted to live in. People, my family members thought I was crazy to move into such a slum, but it's no longer a slum. It's a very desirable place to live. And our motto, I'll end with this, that you, you that uh, Mark Levine used, Councilman Levine, no one size fits all and self-determination. That's what we say. We have to acknowledge that there are many different kinds of HDFCs and our, um, HPD cannot make everyone sign a regulatory agreement. It will never happen. Thank you. I'm Senior Policy Associate. Just repeat your name again for the record. Leo Goldberg, Senior Policy Associate at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Thank you, Chair Williams, for uh, hosting this conversation. Um, the center was founded in 2008 to uh, provide services to low and moderate income homeowners. We work with uh, nonprofit partners across the city to do foreclosure prevention, financial counseling, coastal resiliency assistance, uh, and more. Um, I'm going to skip over um, testimony that I provided about some of the challenges, especially focusing on the one to four housing stock and homeownership, um, and jump to some recommendations we've developed with the Coalition for Affordable Homes, which is a group of nonprofits um, that provide foreclosure prevention and also develop affordable homeownership opportunities citywide. Um, we uh, are very heartened to hear about home fix because we've identified home repair assistance as a major gap in what the city offers to low and moderate income homeowners right now. We did a survey in East New York that found that 63% of homeowners we spoke to had an outstanding home repair need that they couldn't meet. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing more details about home fix and working with the council and HPD to make sure that's something that really uh, helps this population of people. Um, we also have a continuing need for foreclosure prevention services. Uh, the uh, foreclosure crisis is now behind us, but uh, the lingering effects of predatory lending are still very much affecting many outer borough neighborhoods, and we commend the council for your ongoing support of foreclosure prevention. Um, one thing we uh, think really needs to be improved is the way the city deals with tax liens on seniors and low-income homeowners. There's an opportunity to preserve them in their homes. The current tax lien sales structure pushes them out in too many cases. Um, we also think that down payment assistance can be strengthened. The grant amount can be increased uh, to similar amounts offered in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and elsewhere. Um, and while HPD uh, has made some important steps in uh, acknowledging CLTs as a solution. There's a lot that can be done there, and we think CLTs should be given priority in RFPs um, and also given uh, a fair taxation, which is something that Intro 1269, which is coming before the council, uh, would do. So uh, to wrap up, I think we're excited about HPD's uh, new programs, also Open Door, um, but uh, we're really hoping to work with both the council and HPD to make sure they're effective and, and that there's a lot more to be done. So thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Excuse me, Chairman Williams. I have a 90-second statement from John McBride. Uh, if, if I sure. may, I'd like to read it. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, and what Sylvia said about the dilapidated conditions of our apartments, when we moved in in 1976, we used to, if a neighbor wanted a cup of sugar, you could hand it through the wall to the next apartment in those days when we moved in. John McBride's statement. Uh, HDFC co-ops are different in some ways than Mitchell Lamas, similar in others. While Mitchell Lamas were built as brand new affordable housing for residents, HDFC co-ops were typically created in buildings that were in poor condition and simply falling apart, and the city didn't have the money to repair them. These buildings were sold to the residents in the as-is condition, and offering plans from HPD specifically stated that the housing violations would not be fixed by the city and that, for example, out-of-service elevators would not be fixed by the city. This was in writing. Decades later, it's almost hard to imagine, but the residents of these HDFC co-ops shouldered the burden and invested decades of sweat equity and their own personal funds to do so. After the fiscal crises of the 70s, HPD had over 10,000 buildings to manage, and in most cases, the city's goal was to find someone, anyone, to take them. HDFC shareholders across the city saved over 1,200 of these abandoned, rundown buildings that the city couldn't even auction off at the time by taking them on, repairing them, often with their own hands and own money. The deal was home ownership and complete resident shareholder control of private property after a restriction period, plain and simple. Now we are told that the city wants to pretend that the terms of these deals in writing don't exist and that HPD wants to essentially take control of these buildings from the very people who saved them. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just, it seemed that HPD is Make sure we're, we're separating a couple of the buildings out. One is folks that would have gone into a regulatory agreement. It seems that HPD, HPD has recognized that the one side doesn't fit all and is regrouping now, which I think is good based on the work you've done, based on work particular council members and the committee has done. Then there's another group that's facing foreclosures. Are, in, in, in coalition, is that separated out the same way, or are you just viewing it all as one? I mean, as a coalition, yeah. We're campaigning on all fronts okay. that can help HDFCs. That we're, we're, we oppose the regulatory agreement, one size fits all. We oppose the repeal of the damn tax abatement, which is part of our founding documents. It's in my deed from 1993 that we have until 2029, this tax abatement, as well as 40% of our sale profits. In my, I'm a five-story old law walk, walk up, and we have cut checks for over $300 million to HPD for the 40% of the sale profit that we had to turn over to the city, we couldn't take out our flip tax. So we lost $66,000 worth of flip tax that we could have piled back into the building. I have plumbing from 1876. So anyway, I'm just trying to say that at this point, we are across the board. We oppose the damn tax repeal. So it seems that we've made some headway on the first part, the regulatory agreement and the, the folks that were going to be forced to do that. And, and they also made some changes, I remember, in terms of paying for some of the utilities. I remember there were some changes there uh, as well from the, the last hearing that we had. I'm not sure about the changing utilities, but there's been no progress on HPD pulling back from wanting to repeal the damn tax abatement early to okay. force us to sign. There's been, uh, they have not budged from that position. Where, when, is it, when are they saying they want to repeal the damn tax? They want to repeal it now so that they can force us to sign the regulatory agreement they came up with. So I, I want to check that. Um, there's someone here, because my understanding is that they were pausing on the regulatory agreement. So if they're saying they're pausing, but they're still trying to use a strong arm to get you to yes. sign it, um, then um, I need to check on that. But yes, please do. Okay. As far as the dam tax, the city council has to, is the body that would repeal the dam tax. Oh, I see. HPD. I don't think we're going to do that going right to now. city council, so. and we, we as a committee, HDFC um, steering committee, we started meeting with indi individual council members, yourself included, Chairman, and <laughs> we found that a lot of city council people and the mayor didn't really have that much information about HDFC buildings. So we we did a lot of educating. And uh, the city council people that we've talked to, they, we open their eyes and ears, and they're, so they're not going to blanketly just get rid of the dam tax because that was used as, as a hammer over our heads because they want to make, they have a move. I don't believe that HPD in the city 
has moved away from having all buildings sign a regulatory agreement, the successful buildings. I think, and I Anne Marie said that today. That was the focus, not the, the uh, foreclosure buildings. They want the uh, other buildings to sign regulatory agreements, all buildings. My, my understanding is we've successfully gotten them to agree that the one regulatory agreement that they had did not fit all of the buildings that were there. So I think we've gotten to that point. I want to just be clear on that. I, I can't speak for the next council. I, at least I know where we are now. I don't see the council anytime soon taking away the damn tax. I think the coalition has done a very good job in pushing forward. That doesn't mean nothing will change. Um, but right now, I think as we're waiting for this to play out, at least for another few months or however, maybe hopefully a year or more. But I think while we're figuring this out, I can't see the council repealing it right at this moment in time while we're saying they're still doing this listening about the regulatory agreement. That can change and you should continue to keep the pressure on to make sure that the answer it always will. remains the same. The second part is with the foreclosures. Is there a point, of, I want, I'm interested, is there any point that you can see a building would have to complete the foreclosure to go to the uh, rent stabilized uh, apartments? Like, at what point is it too far that, that there's no other option for a building in your opinion? Well, we're almost there now because the judgments are about to be entered, and once that's entered, it's public record that you're facing foreclosure. So, I'm, so I'm asking a different question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. In, in just forget about what HPD is doing. Okay. When, in your mind, does it come to a point where the building is insolvent and they cannot continue the way it's going and the foreclosure to go to rent stabilized is the best option? We haven't gotten there. With the 12 that we've done outreach to, we've come up with a five-year budget plan, a five-year marketing plan. Uh, they still have the ability to sell, et cetera. So we haven't gotten yet to the 12. But I'm, I just want to, I'm trying to think of philosophically. Is there a point that you believe that a building can get there? Can get to a point where they can't manage themselves? Yes. I, we're coming from no, leave no building uh, behind, but I do believe that if we have until next fall, if we have until next fall to work on the remaining 55 buildings, I think that we can turn around more than half of them. All okay. right. So Does philosophically, do you, do you think there is a point where if we've done everything and something can happen, do you philosophically, does the coalition philosophically agree that there might be a point that the foreclosures have to go through? Okay, I'm, I don't have all the foreclosure committee with me here, but I do understand what you're saying. Practically speaking, there might be some buildings that no matter what you try, uh, the internal structure <laughs> and unity is lacking for that building to successfully manage itself going forward. That can happen. I agree that can happen. Okay, yes. and you think... By next fall, if this thing, if this is postponed by next fall, that's enough time for us to reach those buildings. And at that point, you would agree that the whatever buildings couldn't be saved is probably the best option to move forward. I kind of don't want to go on record as saying that they should go to private developers because you know I've shared with you what happens to foreclosed HDFCs. Such those are foreclosed HDFCs that have gone into rent stabilization. They've gone into rent stabilization, but they're flipping for seventeen point three million dollars. And they are renting. They're renting their uh, vacancies at 3,300. In this is a five-story walk-up, 35 units. What if on we West can, 16th. I don't, so I, we, I, I, I don't know if we can as a city, but what if we can? I don't know if we can, but if there's a way to put a mechanism in there that prevents or dissuades flipping of properties. This there is a 20-year regulatory agreement on this property as we speak. The, regula the ability of HPD to adequately regulate these properties is nil. They have like four or five people to do uh, for hundreds of regulatory agreements. So they really don't have the capacity to prevent So you're saying flipping. those folks that are flipping are doing something that's illegal? It's not illegal. No. Wait, unfortunately so not. What I'm trying to say, I'm saying if, if we have Unethical, an yeah. there's a regulatory agreement now on those buildings. Yes. Are you saying the regulatory agreement is not being followed? There's no sales cap. Yeah, but I'm saying, what if we can get find a way to do something like that? Oh, well, okay. If, if you can bring that down, fine. The, the regulatory agreement would have to be strengthened, but it's also not monitored. So the $3,300 a month rentals, this is not affordable housing. It no, once was an HDFC. There's not one HDFC in the four boroughs that has a maintenance fee of $3,300 a month. Mm -hmm. In fact, 1500 is the highest. So if you want to ask me, would I agree the TPT program is the best way to go? I look at this and say, mm, not so sure, not with the present system. So what would be the best answer for those buildings that we agree may not have the ability to manage themselves? That you, that you have, uh, you treat like an ICU and you have massive input to reorganize the tenants and have them go back to co-op status wherever possible. 
Massive, you mean infusion of capital? I have not-for-profit that, for example, Neighborhood Housing Services has that contract that they got from UHAB, and they're only a year old and they're very green. There's only five people. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to actually um, debt forgiveness and infusion of capital because we did it for the banks, so I have no problem. But there are, just haven't seen this even sometimes um, with assisting tenants and things. There are sometimes when you infuse that capital but it still doesn't fix the problem. So you don't want to push for that. And then like you say, there might be internal structures where you go right back into the same thing. And so I'm trying to get to the point where if there's a building like that, what's the best, what's the best result? What's Part the best of the solution will have to be HDFC 101. It's got to be, education has got to come into this because that's one of the failures that has happened. Uh, you have co-ops who've been around uh, for decades who have hardly had a maintenance increase and can't pay their bills. Mm. And uh, you, you, you've got to educate these people and, uh, and let them, you know, through HDFC 101, we've got to see to it that they are part of a conversation <laughs> where education uh, is moved to the fore. Okay. Uh, Ch Chair Williams, may I, may I beg your, yeah. um, about the things we've come across that has led to these issues with uh, rears? No training for housing court. No training ahead of time about wills and estates. As I said, two-thirds of these are senior citizens. Many have passed on. So uh, they don't know about surrogate court. They don't know about commercial properties and how to run them. Right now, 30% of the HDFCs facing foreclosure have commercial properties. They didn't realize that the commercial property tax does not get an abatement. So they've been paying the commercial property tax not knowing that they should have built into their commercial leases that the vendor, that the store, take over the commercial property tax. Also, they weren't told they should get separate water meters for those properties such as beauty salons, laundromats, and dry cleaners that use a lot of water. So a lot of these HDFCs facing foreclosure were, pay were paying sky-high water bills because they didn't, weren't taught get a separate water meter for your vendor. All of this was missing from the training. So this is the kind of thing that you would build into, you know, going forward to help make these co-ops more financially successful. And uh, another thing that a lot of, quite a few people live in struggling HDFCs who have loans. They're paying their loans for their back taxes and water to the city. They're not on the foreclosure list yet, but they're struggling. They say that when they make their monthly payments, the majority of that goes to the interest and very little to the principal. So the city in our building experienced that but we were lucky that a community service society, one time they made a loan to us so we were able to pay our taxes and back taxes and water bill because we were doing the same thing. Making monthly payments, it went to interest, not, not the principal. So that is, I don't know if that's something the city council could look into, but the city's interest rates are outrageous, worse than any bank or a, a shyster type lending company that I could think of. Thank you. I'm just wondering if uh, um, CNYCN has any comments on my questions about those particular buildings that may seem insolvent or may seem that they don't have an internal structure to move forward in a solvent way. So I, I defer to the co-op experts. We don't deal with HDFCs. We focus more on one to four family homeowners. I would just add that we are in the process of creating a community land trust with some nonprofit partners. And while our land trust is focused on new construction for affordable homeownership, other land trusts that are in the process of development are looking at opportunities to take on distressed HDFCs because it would be a way of preserving democratic governance, but with a committed steward, not a for-profit developer that would look to flip. Which, which who's working on that? Um, so nicely, the New York City Community Land Initiative uh, is kind of the, the umbrella group, the coalition group that's incubating several um, nascent community land trusts, and I can provide more information about them. All right, that would be great. I'd love for the uh, committee to, um, to be able to look at that. Um, I want to say thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate it. Uh, those are all the questions. Thank uh, you for listening. Thank you. Oh, thank no you. problem. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, barring any votes that this committee has to take, this will be uh, my last hearing of this term. I just want to thank uh, everyone involved and, and all the staff of the committee, uh, Megan Chen, Jose Connors, Sarah Gasolum, um, all the previous staff uh, that have been here, all my 
colleagues uh, who were a part of the committee and even the administration uh, for I think which was a, a great four years. I think we accomplished a lot in these four years, more than probably a lot of folks thought we would. And I think we did it in a way that was productive and um, uh, collegial even when uh, disagreeing even though we had some pretty interesting hearings and pretty interesting moments, we got through them. Uh, it's just been very prideful for me to have gone from a community and tenant organizer to chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee of uh, the City of New York. I've had an uh, amazing uh, pleasure doing that, and I thank the speaker for allowing me uh, to be here and my staff on my, uh, on my side as well who work in my office. So with that, it's been a pleasure, and we'll, we'll see what happens next year. I hope everybody has a fantastic holiday. Fantastic New Year, and I thank always the Sergeant of Arms who have made these uh, great hearings and productive ones as well. Thank you. With that, Godspeed everybody. And this hearing, oh, for the record, we got some stuff for the record. Habitat for Humanity presented uh, testimony for the record. With that, this hearing is now closed.